Hello ladies and gentlemen, Gabe's to here. This is the tank guide for Mythic Tectus. And uh, tanking this fight can be quite difficult. The real challenge here is that the incoming damage uh, can be very severe and spiky, but more importantly, it really requires very precise and constant adjustment of your position, uh, even as a tank. It's one of these fights that really forces your hand in terms of where you stand and when and how you move and all that good stuff because uh, your movement as a tank affects the positioning of the entire raid simply because of you know the mobs being the source of of all these uh, distance base effects like crystal and barrage so let's get started all right to begin let's briefly cover the changes on mythic um, the first one and most important to tanks is that the adds that spawn in the first phase, the Earth Warper and Berserker, in Mythic will spawn throughout the entire fight. So you will always have these appearing uh, very frequently, just like they would normally in, in only the first phase on normal or heroic. The other big change is that when Tectus or one of the shards is killed, a sort of hollowed out version of that previous mob will respawn and continue to attack you. So uh, you may have noticed Tectus just died and he came back. It's difficult to see, you, know, you can see his, his uh, visual there, but he's actually got 20% of his normal health. Um, the good news is that he does not gain energy at a rapid rate based on his health being depleted. Uh, but just for tanking purposes, you have to keep in mind that you will get the hollowed out respawn of Tectus when he dies and both shards when they die. The moats do not respawn, you know, that still signifies the end of the fight when they die. Now, one critical thing to consider uh, for tanking is whether you're using three or two tanks. And we extensively used both methods. Uh, in fact, you see I'm a healer in this footage here, but uh, we spent quite a bit of time doing three tanks and I was the third tank in those setups. Um, there are different pros and cons to each, so I'll just briefly talk about those and why we settled on two tank. Uh, for three tanking, the main benefit is a extremely high sense of control for movement and positioning. As I mentioned at the start, it can be difficult uh, to always be in the proper positions. You really have to focus on it as a tank in this fight. But with three tanking, you're essentially allowed to have one tank completely in control of the ad spawns, the Berserker and Earth Warper, throughout the entire fight. And the other two tanks are free to focus solely on their positioning. Uh, relative to the the bosses that actually, you know, cause positional uh, requirements throughout the fight, you know, the shards, the moats, all that good stuff. So that's the main advantage for three tanking is that one of your tanks can be dedicated solely to those ads, pretty much, and is free to move around um, relative to where the raid group is. So you can pick up the ads when they come in on the range and all that good stuff. Uh, on the other hand, the disadvantage is simply a much higher potential for tank death because the healing has to be spread so thin. Uh, often what will happen is if your tank's just getting lucky with, you know, unmitigated hits, and this is happening to one or two or even three tanks at a time, this is going to be a problem because uh, there just aren't enough healers, there's not enough healing output to help focus on all the tanks appropriately. Um, you know, they're simply limited by a number of global cooldowns for healing and it's difficult to always heal all three tanks at the right time. So the fewer tanks you use, the easier that becomes for the healers, generally speaking. The damage intake is going to be the same regardless, um, but it's simply a matter of being able to target and cast on the right target when necessary for your healers. Uh, the big advantage to two tanking, in addition to healing output, is also the damage output, of course. So dropping one tank, even if your tank has pretty high damage, which most of them will in the last phase, that matters, you're still going to be able to add more DPS if you just swap in uh, another DPS player in that position or healing for more survival, whatever it is. The big disadvantage to two tanks is simply lack of positioning control. So if you're using two tanks, you really need at least one or two uh, hunters in the raid to help with misdirection for the ads. Because without that, you're going to feel very obligated to move around as a tank to pick up the ads because they'll spawn near the range group and they're gonna be so far away you don't 
have range to actually taunt from there. And because of that, if you move and you have one of the big ads on, or one of the bosses on you, Tectus or a shard or something, you're going to potentially cause major issues with the uh, spawning of Crystal and Barrage. So you really cannot afford to do so. Therefore, if you're two tanking, you need to pretty much stay stationary with your tank partner at the relative positions that you need to be in and rely on hunters or whatnot to misdirect to you. And once they get close enough, then you can taunt them. Um, one minor tip to that is to utilize outside taunt sources. So if you have someone in melee that can just taunt something toward you, uh, you know, melee DPS, a, a monk healer or something like that, that can help quite a bit. All right, so let's talk a bit about tanking assignments based on the method that you're going to use. So if you're using two tanks, which we are here in the video, then your basic tanking assignments can be seen on the screen. Uh, you have tank B, which is generally going to be in charge of the adds throughout most of the fight, the Earth Warper and the uh, Berserker, and tank A, who will generally be in charge of the boss type mobs. Uh, the exception here is at the start, where tank B starts on Tectus, and both tanks are allowed to help with the adds because while tank B can't really afford to move around, tank A can do so before Tectus dies. Um, and of course, Mr. X will commonly still be going toward tank B because, you know, hunters probably don't want to change that around. Once you get to phase two where Tectus respawns, dies and respawns, then it goes to the standard method. So both shards are picked up by tank A, the single tank. Tectus will remember and remain on tank B, the respawn, until it dies pretty quickly. And then from that point forward, tank B is full, focused solely on picking up adds. Now, the issue with this method is that you have to be careful of, in phase two. If both shards are on one tank, they can survive, but they need very heavy healing because it's, a, it's quite a bit of damage on that one player. Um, so just be aware of the spike potential in that situation. But in terms of control, it's much easier if you do it that way. And then finally, in the third phase, when both shards die and they're respawning, you get the eight motes. Uh, again, this is all about control and focusing your healing on one target if possible. So you're going to single tank all the shards and the motes um, on the single tank A. And again, tank B handles the adds. Since it's the burn phase, the adds are not really a concern. So tank B needs to just keep them to the side, make sure they don't hurt anybody else and just do their best to survive during that period. Uh, whereas tank A is, is you know, focusing on the moats, keeping them attackable, avoiding all the crystal and barrage and all that stuff. Now, obviously, if you use a three tank setup, then assignments become much simpler. Uh, you'll start off with tank A on Tectus, and tank B and C can get the ads, doesn't really matter there. Uh, for phase two, tank A is on shard A, tank B is on shard B, and tank C is again on ads, so tank C is generally the add tank. And then finally in the last phase, you still want all the moats on one target because if you try to split them, it's just gonna to be too difficult for DPS to cleave appropriately. So you have tank A on the moats, tank B on the shard, both shards rather. So the shards should be killed and kept near the moats, but uh, obviously they do not dictate the end of the fight. Um, one of these shards that was being tanked by tank B in phase two will remember uh, that person, but they should be uh, quickly ready to pick up the other shard as it's respawning, just the, the husk of it. And then of course tank C is on the adds again. Uh, as mentioned though, I still don't recommend this method because it makes it more difficult for control and healers in the last phase, and that's really the important phase. On the other hand, it's much easier to learn the fight and get to that last phase if you're using three tanks. So the phases one and two are much simpler when you have that third person able to move around and pick up ads and stuff. So adjust accordingly, um, whatever your raid needs. And now if you are a tank on this fight, you probably have to help deal with the ads, the Earth Warper and the Berserker. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that the ads are not interruptible in a standard sense, but any cast that they do can be interrupted by a stun effect. So if you have a short duration, or excuse me, short cooldown stun, you can use that to halt the big abilities. The primary ones are from the Earth Warper. The Berserker's charge, while it does a little bit of damage and can be annoying, is not a huge issue. So you want to focus your attentions on the Earth Warper, essentially, as long as the Berserker is in position. 
Uh, the Earth Warper starts with a Gift of the Earth, and standard is to either stun to interrupt it or just intercept it with your body. But if you let it go off, you have to make sure that it touches you or someone else. If it touches the boss, it causes a heal, which can be a problem. Uh, so the best thing to do is to use a stun on the first Gift of the Earth and on the Flechettes. If you don't have enough stuns available, the Flechettes can go off, but you have to make sure that you face the Earth Warper away from everyone else in the raid. This is critical. It's a, a cone attack, and it, it's got a huge range. So essentially, if it's facing anybody else, the range group or anything, it will hit them. Usually, it shouldn't kill people, because most of the time, um, no one will be taking damage unless they do something and screw up and die, except for melee. But for ranged players, generally, they won't take any extra damage on this fight unless they screwed up big time and they're dead. That said, you still need to try not to for, uh, allow them to get hit by that attack. So try to face the Earth Warper away. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is if you're taking a shard or tectus or anything like that, you can't really afford to move around very much because you can't move the boss too close to the range group or out of melee positions. So when you pick up one of these ads, like the Earth Warper, you're allowed to rotate your position around the main boss that you're tanking, but not to back up or move forward or anything. Because if you move out of position with the big boss, it causes positional issues um, entirely for the rest of the raid. So don't be afraid to rotate, but that's all you can really do. Once you rotate into your position, you have the Earth Warper facing the proper direction. You should you know, remain in that position. If your raid can afford it, it's also a good idea to have one or two melee DPS help out with the Earth Warper, uh, particularly someone that can stun as a backup. So if you have a stun that's available for every, you know, initial cast of Gift of the Earth, for example, or at least once every 30 seconds, because that's how often the ads spawn, uh, you can do that in conjunction with a DPS partner. So in our case, we had a rogue who was attacking the Earth Warper every time, and he would actually stun the first Gift of the Earth and then allow, um, you know, myself as, as a monk healer or a tank backup stun to get the other one if necessary. So that will help quite a bit. Um, but again, it's all about positioning and facing for tanking itself. All right, so I've talked a lot about positioning, so let's actually get into the specifics of it here. Uh, you will may you may notice around the room there are a number of raid markers, and you don't have to use exactly what we do here, obviously. If your raid does something different, that's fine. The important thing to note is that your position as a tank, if you're holding Tectus or a Shard or a Moat or anything, has to be essentially max range from the ranged group. So wherever they happen to be, you need to be about 40 yards away. Uh, this is critical for the success, success of the raid because if you're any closer, the reaction time that the raid or ranged members have to react to Crystal and Barrage is much shorter, and that can cause major issues. Um, so do your best to keep yourself in that you know 40 yard range from them. As they move, you have to move to match that distance. Uh, the other thing to be careful of, of course, is your stationary position relative to the melee and the ranged clump. So just like in Heroic and Normal, Crystal and Barrage will target ranged players and emanate from the uh, initial boss, whatever boss is casting it, toward that player. So generally speaking, you want to uh, keep your back away from the range group. And similarly, you want to allow melee to be on the opposite side as well. So you've essentially formed a very large triangle so that you never have to stand in the barrage as a tank and the melee don't have to do so either. Another small thing, but important, is that when Tectus dies, comes back as a, a husk at 20%, and when that 20% version, his respawn dies, he will leave that sand pile on the ground. You can see it on the right there. Uh, if you can, try to back up a little bit so that your melee don't have to be near it while they are attacking the boss. Because it can be very difficult when that sand, pi sand pile is out to see the um, little spikes coming up from the ground. They essentially will appear underneath it. So do your best to back up a bit after that appears. Now finally, once you kill the two shards, you get into the phase three or big burn phase, which is where really a difficult uh, part of the fight comes in. 
So I won't go into the full details of the raid positioning and all that stuff. Uh, if you want more information, you can go to the full raid guide, clicking the purple link at the bottom there. Uh, but basically you can see here the idea is that the tanks along with the mobs will be somewhat centered in the room at maximum distance from the range group. And once the shards are dead, it's important that that distance is far enough away. So as a tank, you may need to watch that, that distance and if necessary, before the shards actually start channeling their upheaval, uh, you move them a little bit further away so that they are at that, that max you know, 40 yard range or so. This will just ensure that the range players have enough distance to move uh, once the final phase begins. Now, once the moats start popping up, it's going to be vital that you maximize your survival. So generally speaking, like I said, you'll want one tank to handle the moats and probably the shards as well. It depends if you're two or three tanking, but at least one tank on the moats. Uh, so you can see our tank there is trying to keep them as stationary as possible, which is the key. Uh, if you have to move, make sure you only rotate from side to side so you're not standing in, in the crystalline barrage or whatever. Um, but the more you have to move, the more your melee DPS will suffer. There's one to, exception to this rule, which I'll talk about in a moment, but that's the basic idea. Uh, if you can stay stationary and rotate through your cooldowns, uh, don't be afraid to ask for outside cooldowns if you're tanking the moats, then that's going to be your best case. Uh, it's just a severe amount of damage, but if you have enough active mitigation, depending on your class, you should be okay. So we have our monk tank handle the moats and the shards, and our paladin tank picks up the smaller adds during the last phase. Now, as mentioned, there is one exception to the never move rule, and that just depends on your raid strategy. Uh, one possible method is to increase your melee DPS time um, for a loss in your range DPS on this phase. The basic idea is you essentially, once the moats pop out, you wait a few seconds for barrages to spawn, and then you start backpedaling and just kite in a small circle. Uh, this will allow your melee DPS to essentially follow with you. I shouldn't say follow, but stack with you as a tank. And by moving constantly, they can avoid the fracture uh, spikes because you're always going to be moving enough that you never actually get hit by one. So like I said, this improves melee DPS if your raid uses it, but it does hinder uh, healing and range DPS. Uh, other than that, uh, it's really just a matter of picking up the appropriate ads. So if you're on the ads, the, excuse me, the appropriate mobs, if you're on the ads in this phase, make sure you uh, quickly pick up the Earth Warper and then the Berserker that follows. They'll generally come out right around the start of the phase uh, and just try to face them away from everyone. Use your personal stun on the Earth Warper, on the Flechettes. It doesn't matter if Gift of the Earth is cast in this phase because... Even if it hits a mob, the heal is very minor. It's not going to make a difference. It's more important that you prevent flechettes from killing somebody. So save your stun for that if possible. And generally by the time the phase is over, um, or the fight is over, you know, it won't matter. You won't get a second spawn really. So that about covers phase three, I think. Overall, it's kind of an annoying fight to tank. Uh, it just depends how you handle the adds primarily and therefore how much you're allowed to move around. But um, once you kind of get comfortable to the with the pattern, it's the same every time, which is the good news. So uh, eventually you'll get used to, you know, maintaining that 40 yard distance from the range group, moving when necessary, uh, taunting or gathering the appropriate mobs, depending on your assignment, and then saving your personal cooldowns for that last phase so you can prolong your survival as much as possible. As always, thanks for watching. Good luck, and I'll see you next time. Also, if you want to hang out at the cool kids table, which I never got to, of course, but you can, feel free to subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And I think the lunch just tastes better over there anyway. <laughs>